Hey, this is Pastor Jason Hooper with Kingsway Church and Kingsway College, and we have a special treat for you. Dr. Robert Slearden brought an incredible, life-changing teaching to our Kingsway College students January 11, 2023, that we wanted to make available to our church family, but also to the world. Uh, Robert shared the importance of not just an obedience to what God says, but also what it takes to finish our call, to be faithful to the end, to not just start strong, but also to finish strong as well. And as he unpacked the lives of many God's generals, there were so many incredible life lessons and wisdom that our students were able to glean. We said, this is a now word that can not only save some ministries, but it will save some lives. It also brings an encouragement to bring order where there's been disorder and to prepare for the present and coming move of God to where the glory of God that we experience, whether it be in our services or throughout our cities, would continue to grow greater and greater day by day. And so here is this incredible, life-changing teaching from Dr. Robert Slairdon at Kingsway College. We also ask you to prayerfully consider joining us this fall at Kingsway College. There'll be information at the bottom of the screen where you can uh, find out more information about what Kingsway College is all about and how you can apply to join us, to join us, whether on site or online this fall. God bless you and be encouraged by this teaching. Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year to all of you. God bless you. Has it been a good day so far? I don't, I don't want to see Joshua, but I haven't heard Joshua in worship for a long time. And wow, wow. So aren't you guys blessed to have them here? I mean, teaching in this church, the school worship. Wow, what a blessing. Uh, before I get into my, my, my lesson today, I brought some treasures I want you to know that I brought so you can look at them over here during the break or after school. You remember Evan Robertson, the Welsh revivalist? Well, here is a handwritten note that he wrote and signed on the back, Evan Roberts, about a month before he died. And so you'll get to see his handwriting. And if you can decipher it, you have a gift of interpretation. But um, you, you have to work at it. I'll say it that way. But you'll get to see that if you'd like to do that. That'll be available for you to, to look at. I'm always going to try to bring something for you to look at. Now, this is it's a treasure. It's not one of the oldest or the rarest, but uh, Maria Woodworth Edder, one of her original first edition of her books. And so you, this is one that's called The Acts of the Holy Ghost. And uh, so, um, you know, so I brought that. So if you, there's some of her books that have been reprinted and that's nice, but this is the, this is the original one. So you, I like the first editions. One reason why I like first editions or the early editions, especially from the evangelical world, they change things to fit their present disposition. And so like when you read Charles Finney's books, his biography, if you want to go back and find the closest one to the first edition, because there's ways he describes in praying you don't find in the others. They just say he was earnestly in prayer. Well, that's nice, but he, he will say things like, uh, we were praying and there was unutterable gushings that came up out of us. Well, that's Finney talking about tongues and groaning. This is 1800s. So you're not trying to read something into it. You're just kind of interpret the language of the day and bring it into our language. And so uh, I don't know, they, I don't think they prayed in tongues like we do because we've matured with it, we understand it more. But I think all those guys got into some degree of deeper prayer where the spirit would take over. Unutterable gushings would come forth out of us. That's groanings, travailings, and deeper prayer. So I like to hunt for those kind of treasures. Now, this is probably, Evan Roberts is the, probably the most unique, but this is the second unique treasure. This is Dowie's, one of the volumes of his magazines that he printed. This is uh, volume three from 1896 to 1897. So he would print as magazine, you know, ministers do magazines, but he'd print them. His was weekly, I think it was. I think it was, uh, no, it was monthly. And so um, it was called Leaves of Healing and uh, it has his sermons and testimonies and advertisements, all the stuff in it. So I brought a volume so you could see what, his magazines were like and kind of look at them. So those are available for you to see at the break or after, after class is over. Amen? So I live in all that stuff. To me, when I get that stuff, it's like Christmas every day when I get treasures like that. So if you want to make me happy, buy me something old. And I get very happy. It like it's people, my sister says, Roberts, are you on drugs? I said, no, it's just touching history. 
and being around close I can get to it, you know, especially when I find their clothes or their shoes or, or pen or something. Mm. When I'm dead, you'll go to my closet. There'll be my suits and ties and shirts and jeans, and then there'll be dresses. I did not wear any of them, all right? So defend me after I'm dead. But there's Catherine Kuhlman's TV gowns. There's Francis Hunter dresses. There's, that's in my closet. Isn't that wild? I'm weird, but it works. I'm one of those eccentric characters somehow that I enjoy all of this and, and it works for me and, and I get to go around the world and talk about it and show it and, and do it. It's, it's a pleasure. What I want to do with you today is a little bit different than what I've done in the last few times I was with you. Um, I want to talk about some of the, the principles and teach a little bit more from the scriptures on things that people did successfully and what they did not do that made them make mistakes. Some principles and some storylines uh, of this. So it's, it's going to be a teach tell. Is that okay today? And so we're going to go through different principles I think is important for us to know. Some things may be uh, repetitious for some of you, but the more you hear something, the, the greater hope I have that it'll stick with you. Thank you for the one amen from the left side of the room. And um, uh, that's one thing I learned as a, as a Bible college teacher years ago. The more I say it, people remember it. And I've learned if I say it funny or I make a weird face or gesture, you'll remember it. So that's why I'm kind of animated, not because I'm an actor. It's because I've learned if I'll say something with humor to it, you'll remember it. And, or if I'll do something weird, you'll, you'll, you'll remember the kick and the story will come back to you. So I've learned how to be animated for, the, for a right purpose. I'll say it that way. So uh, it's true. It's like that people... I'll tell you stories that may mean nothing to you today, but in 15 years, there'll be a moment where somebody you're talking to or something that you're facing, the story will come alive to you. It'll be an encouragement or a help to discern something or how to navigate your life and your family through a very tough moment to be successful and happy. We want you, we want you to win. We want you to win in life and in the kingdom. We want you to have a successful life, and we want you to get that big, huge crown when you get to heaven. Some people are just going to show up and don't get nothing. They're just glad they got there. Well, that's not us. We, we don't worry about getting there. We know we're going. We're a whole different kind of kettle of fish, if you want to say it that way. We want to get stuff done, and we're promised a crown. And I want my crown so heavy, I have to carry it, not wear it. And that's why I'm working the way I do. So we're, we're going to start a journey here today. And I've wrote down about six, seven different areas that I want to talk about. And we'll see if we can get to them and uh, how we can go. It's, um, it, it, let's go to Romans chapter 11. We'll start with that particular verse this morning. Romans 11. Good morning, everybody. You all have to make sure you go back and talk to my friend Roz. We've known each other for 40 years. I usually say this, and it's not the best way to say it. She's my oldest living friend. How's that? Uh, not mean that she's old, but she's my friend that I've had the longest in my life. She took me to Africa, her family did when I was 16 years old. Introduced me to Africa, where I got shot at for about 30 minutes and uh, got delivered from the spirit of fear after that incident and uh, been to 127 nations later. So it's partly their fault. And uh, so it's very good. And she, she takes care of these old people. And uh, she didn't like old did not like old people. I know I was there. And for God to give her 400 of them is hilarious. So you might want to work on what you dislike because it might become your main ministry. So, uh, but she loves these elderly people. She takes care of a lot of these elderly people that live in the bush where they have no family. And uh, they're out there, uh, their children, some of them have died of the HIV AIDS epidemic swept through. So they died out and they had to raise the grandchildren, and, and in the bush, there's no Obamacare. There's no social security, and some of them live under a tree on a broken down little mud hut, and she goes in and builds a little house for them, makes sure they're cared for, teaches them the Bible, and gives them purpose. Her little joke with them is, you're, I met you when you're 70. Why haven't you died yet? 
they're 100 years old. They're 90 years old. And they'll say, because of Jesus in you, we have something to do. We've got to intercede for our nation and gave them purpose. Magnificent. So that's, that's who that is sitting back there with a lot more stories. And uh, hopefully you'll get, get to know her a little bit better. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 11 and verse 29 is a verse that I'm sure you're familiar with, but we'll open it up. For gifts, plural, notice it's plural, not just a gift, but gifts and calling, which is singular, it seems to be here. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Now, we all kind of know what uh, this verse means, but first off, we don't talk in this kind of vernacular. Uh, without repentance. It's kind of vague to us. It's kind of not as sharp as we would see in some other translations. So let me give you the Laird in translation. For my gifts and callings, I'll never take back once I grant them to you. I will not repent. I do not make mistakes. For the gifts that I give you and the call that I call you with is with full conscience of your present, your past, and your future. And I call you, and I give you these gifts, and I will never take them back. Now, once he gives them to you, what you do about them is up to you. Many of the gifts that God gives never gets fully activated. They only make an appearance once or twice in life. And then then people call that a special encounter when that could be the lifestyle they could have. For example, we have uh, Paul talking in Philippians about the high calling. I reach for the prize of the high calling. If something, if there's a high, there's a medium. If there's a medium, there's a low. If there's a low, there's a no, or, a, or, or I don't accept it. So we, we, we reach for the high calling. The generals lived in the high calling. That's why they, we give them that title. We have that respect for them. The kind of stories they have is because they didn't visit the high call. They remained in it. Most people visit the high call and call it a special visitation. And they normally live somewhere in the high part of low and the low part of medium. That's where most people live. That's where most of the demons or the main warring factors of the demonic won't fight you as much when you live in that arena of your call, all right? It's when you go into the other upper echelons of it, the greater authority, the greater dominion, the greater... Uh, impact, so forth, then you kind of change what fights you. And we'll talk, if I have time today, on what I call the death blow, that you, you're going to have to survive. And I'm going to talk to you about that hopefully by the end of the day. But when you, when you move out of, mo- most churches and ministers live with only a couple of blocks of influence around the church. And uh, that's because they cooperate with the principality and do not know it. The goal of a principality is not to destroy the church, but to control it. You should write that down. Because we assume that the the enemy wants to remove the church. Well, that's the ultimate goal, but what a greater way to control his true opponents, the children of the light, than to regulate the house that they all worship in, trained in, and function from. All right? And so uh, it's, it's sad to me that that's where most people live because there's so much more fun on the other side or in the upper echelons. But there's also so much more warfare. That's why when you hear the stories and you read some of the books I've written about the, some of the challenging things and the stories I've told you, you think, well, why? Well, sometimes the intensity of the warfare is, is, is interesting. Princip- the, the, the big warfare is a multiple warhead, right? A multiple warhead. That means he hits you in a multiple arena at the same time. It's a multiple warhead. It could be three things spiritual. It could be one thing physical, two spiritual. spiritual. It's a multiple warhead. Most of you in the room, if the devil throws one bomb at you, you'll pretty much survive it pretty good. You, you, you won't fall off and faint and backslide and run away and curse God and die. You're not going to do that. Uh, most of you in this room, uh, one, one warhead, one attack, you can survive. And maybe some of you can handle two at the same time. But I've noticed that when you get over to three and multiples of, of that more, it, it, it's a little much. But you're going to have to have the capacity 
to function in the natural and the spiritual at the same time with both in conflict, rearing its ugly head and roaring its voice at you and be able to maintain peace and forward movement through the whole thing. And so uh, we'll, we're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit later. But it says here, the gifts and the callings of God without repentance. Uh, the call of God is work. Uh, the call of God, when God comes to you and calls you, first off, it's not a, how do I say that? If he asks you, he calls and asks you to work for him, you can say no. Let me go down this road for a moment. You can say no if you want to and still go to heaven. You can say no to the call of God and still have all the biblical promises that, that belong to you because they belong to you as a child of God, not a called child. They belong to you because you're a child of God. So all the promises of healing and abundance and protection and all, are yours because you're his son and daughter. So saying no to the call does not affect your status as a son and daughter. If you say no to the call of God, it does not cause the devil to have more authority over you. Because some people are scared of that. When I was out in ministry years ago, I, began, I was in my 30s. I'm 56, uh, going to be 57 next month, and I'm resisting, but it's still coming. <laughs> I don't know what Greek word helps me get delivered from it. I haven't found it yet, but... I'm a looking. But when I was a lot younger than I am now, I saw men my age maintaining their life and sad and kind of, mm. and I thought, what? and I saw enough of them like that. I thought, is that what I'm going to be when I get that age? Because I, I was, you know, you learn through observation by just watching and observing. I'm not being judgmental. I just, it is what it is. You see it. And I thought, I don't want to be 50 some years old and look like that or have that kind of disposition. So I started asking them, why are you like this? You know, I, I'm one of those guys that ask the rudest questions and get away with it. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's an anointing. Maybe it's aunt, talking to all those old women. I know how to ask questions now. So uh, I, I'll just ask them, I've known you for a while and you don't look happy. Is there something wrong? Or because the last few times I'm here, it's the same grumpy thing I've seen. The same kind of, I don't like this, and this brother bothered me. And it's, you know, that kind of complaining, grumpy stuff. And, hmm. and the wife don't even look pretty no more. She's, hmm, too. And so, he's like, hmm, hmm. And that's what they have. <laughs> and you got the children that are like, maybe Christian, maybe not. You're not quite sure yet because they're processing all of that. And so asking questions to that kind of people. I found the common thing they said, not every time, but the most common thing they said was, I really didn't want to do this. And I thought, then why did you do it? And here's what they said. Well, I didn't want the devil to have greater access to me kind of thing. I thought, where did you get that? From some stupid people they talked to, they thought were smart. And then they would say, you know, I, I, I did this because I was told I was called and I was so far into it that when I discovered I didn't really want to do it, I was too old to change careers, so I'm just going to finish it out doing this. So they just get into a comfortable position, have enough people in the church to keep the church paid for, have a good salary, and just bounce along until they die. And I thought, uh -uh. either I'm in or I'm out. I'm not one of these in-between guys. Either I'm all in or I'm all out. I, I can't live like that. And so it began to bother me because I saw that. So let me address this again with you. There are, when the call of God comes to you, you can say no. But you'd also, or you can also say yes. But you can say no and still go to heaven. Isn't that nice? What guarantees you going to heaven is your faith in what Christ did at Calvary for you. Not your call aspect here. Your faith in what Christ did brings salvation to you. And so, like I said a moment ago, all the Bible promises are made to the sons and daughters, not just to the called ones. So those promises that he made is still yours if you say no. So what I'm trying to do is remove all these pressure points so that you can find some time with yourself and your conscience and your internal person and think about what it means to accept the call of God. 
Will I work for him wherever he places me and will I be happy? Will I choose to be happy? Now, we always think of having a ministry that's huge in a big city with all the bells and whistles and the big star church thing. What if God puts you in the middle of South Dakota or over somewhere in 100 miles from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, out there in the middle of nowhere with just some bugs and coyotes? Is that where you're from? No, oh, okay. Well, the Lord send him. He likes it. Give him half of South Dakota. So, are you still following me? It, it, not everybody's going to end up like that. Only a few are. So, the people I'm talking to today, most of you will have a good ministry, but it will not be one of those wick, big wow things. We're doing. Mm. The call of God comes, and you become a willing vessel to do whatever and wherever he plants you. There's no negotiations. That's a millennial idiocy because you negotiate for your jobs here. You think you're all of this because your professor told you. God hasn't changed how he operates in thousands of years and don't think because you popped on the earth with your new degree, God's gonna change the whole system to fit millennial attitudes. <laughs> no. All right, so, the, so we have to accept the reality. When I accepted the call of God, I never thought I would be what I am today. When, when, when like Pastor Hooper talks about the book, if you notice, I bowed my head. I do it every time. Thank you, Jesus, because I know where I came from. I know there is no way what has happened in my life thus far could I have done by my own talents and abilities and, and intelligence. Now, I'm not stupid, but I'm not that smart. Just like you, you're not ignorant, but you're not that smart. Only God can do this stuff. And so when I see this, when, when people who don't even know me use the term God's generals, that came from me in my little bedroom in Tulsa, Oklahoma when I was a little boy. Now it's a standard in Christian vocabulary all over the world, and I started it. Kind of gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling once in a while. So I know where all that came from. So when I said yes to the call of God, my point of references in my family were country preachers. I kind of assumed that's what I was going to be doing. I never thought I'd be doing this. I like this better, though. <laughs> I don't like being around chickens and pigs and people that take care of them. My cousin raises 300,000 chickens at a time. The only chicken I like is the dead one on my plate. I don't want to feed it. I don't want to pluck it. I don't want to do nothing to it. I just want to dive into it and enjoy it for an afternoon lunch meal. Okay, everybody still with me? So the, the call of God, you have to be willing to go where God wants to put you. Most of these people never knew they would become what they became. And in their minds, most of them never saw themselves the way we see them. Now they knew some things about the, the, the size of their ministry and so forth, but they, they really didn't think that. I always ask all the big preachers when I get around them, are you famous? Just to watch them react. And it's interesting what they say. I asked Bonky one time, Mr. Bonky, are you famous? Now, we all know he's famous. You know, he's a big dude. He goes, a few people know my name. And that's all he said. They're uncomfortable with the question because they know better than anybody else that where they're standing, only Jesus could put them there. But you have to be willing not to be there. Some people come into the call of God already with an expectation that I want this and I want it this way or I'm not gonna do it. Well, then it's not gonna work. You, you will not be a, a, a general kind of person, that attitude alone. Are you with me? And so the, the, the call of God, when he asks you, needs to be something that you come to a reality, I'm committed to work for Christ at his pleasure, his bidding. Whatever he wants, I am willing to do. If it ends up in a place that I thought I would never be, a place that I naturally do not like, I will go 
and I will take on the responsibility with all my heart, all my joy, and serve God to my, my best for him, wherever it is. And that's how you approach that. When you come to the call and accept the call of God, it also means, number two, nothing of you. Your ambitions must die. Not be placed on the table aside the call. They must just go ahead and die. They always ask Catherine Kuhlman, what's the secret of your ministry? Oh, Miss Kuhlman, how do you have so many wonderful miracles? And she told you every service, I died. I died. Oh, how do you have great miracles? I died. They never heard her. She told them for her whole life, here's how it happened. I died. Catherine Kuhlman died a long time ago. She told the whole story. Please die. The sooner you die, the better off your life will be in ministry. Just go ahead and kill yourself. Commit spiritual suicide and die for Jesus and let him raise you back the right way. You all get that point? You know, just go ahead and like, Lord, if I have to go preach to the naked people of New Guinea for the rest of my life, I'll be the happiest preacher that preaches to naked people any place on the planet. Just, I'll, I'll just do it, won't complain. Now, you'll have some tough moments because you're human. There'll be days your brain will go, are you kidding me? Because your brain still talks. You like to slap it around a little bit, but it's still, once in a while, it says, my brain told me one day, if I could leave you, I would. That's pretty bad when your brain's trying to find a way out because it couldn't control me and my spirit was in charge. That's, you got to get yourself in order so you can do it. But the, the call of God, you, you, you got to go ahead and just die to your ambitions, whatever the Lord wants you to do. The sooner you die to self and pick up the, your cross, whatever you want me to do, however I need to go, and follow it. No matter how far you go, you don't hear many cross sermons anymore. You don't hear many dying to self sermons. And you might want to go back and find some and read them. Uh, or find when Jason, Pastor Jason was preaching them and go pull them out and hear them again. Go get Catherine's sermon when she's dying 40,000 times on stage. Go hear that and she'll cry, I died, but that was the greatest moment in my life. I found the greatest power when I died. I used to be like, well, how do you kill yourself? How do you die? You just keep saying no to everything that's contrary to what God has told you in the word and what God has asked you to do for him. And anything that comes up, you slap it down. You, you knock it down and you deal with it. You have to die to ambitions so that when God gives you what he gives you, it won't affect you the wrong way. Success is one of the greatest enemies in ministry. Being real successful. Because there comes a little arrogance like, look what I've done. Mm. Mm -mm. It doesn't work that way. The call of God is he's asking you to work for him. And if you say yes, it's where he wants to plant you, how he wants you to do it, and as long as he wants you to do it. And the places sometimes he plants you is difficult. We all want to go to a place where it's easy. That's why everybody goes to Kenya. When you go to Africa, you go to certain countries where it's already kind of broken open. There's a move of God going, and they all go, they go, wow, we're on the mission field. <laughs> no, you're not. You're in a revival. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's where you're like, you go to certain parts of Africa. You, you, you may suffer because they don't have air condition, and they don't have the right type of restaurants you want to go to. That's not suffering. And there's a move of God there, but you have to go places where you know, there's nothing there and the terrain is tough and the people are not mature in the things of the Lord and you have to go in there and work on it. And it may take years to get people ready for a move of God. That's part of a call. Can you do that? And you need to come to a conscious of that. I came to Jesus when I was a little boy and I've never left him. There are times in my life I was better than other, but I've never left him because I like him. I actually like Jesus. I like what he said when I read the book. I like how he talked to people. I like what he did to mean people. I like what he did to, to demons and politicians. He yelled at them. 
I like, I mean, I like Jesus. I want to hang out with him and say, who's going to yell at today? <laughs> Let's see what he's going. I mean, Jesus, if you read his story, he has all these things. And I like his, what he tells us to do. I like how he lived in my house as a little boy. My mom and my grandmother showed me a living Jesus. He was bigger in my house than he was in my church. And that's the way it should be. Because you live at home more than you come to the church. And I met him as a little boy when I gave my heart to him. It's just as real to me as I'm sitting here in front of you. My born again experience was just a solid, non-emotional, no glorious euphoric feeling. I just said, yes, I want you. And he said, yes, I want you. And he came in and he sits in there all the time. And because I didn't have a father, my mother, my grandmother said, make God your dad and he'll be a good dad to you. And they directed all of the pain and the vacancy in my home of my dad toward God. And so I went toward him as my dad. They would help me, and I had to hear him, had to obey him, and he would help me. And that's the way it's still at today. And that's why as a little boy, I grew up the way I did with my family and my dad. And that's the way it's still there. So when the call of God came to me in my conscience, I was thrilled that he actually wanted me to work for him. Because not everybody gets this opportunity. Everybody gets to be born again, which is wonderful. But not everybody does he tap on the shoulder and say, I need you to go do this for me. Not everybody gets that. Everybody gets a job of sorts in the kingdom, a responsibility in the kingdom, but not everybody gets the call to the five offices, one of the five offices. So when he looked at me and said, I want you. That thrilled me that out of 7 billion people, he liked me. Now I knew he accepted me and gave me eternal life and he was a good dad, but now he wanted to hire me to be a spokesperson, a representative of his heart, his kingdom in my time. Wow, what a privilege. Not everybody gets that. Not everybody gets that cup of call. A lot of people act like they do, but there's no fruit, so they don't have it. If you don't have the fruit, <laughs> you don't have it. Fruit tells you what you got. I mean, it's not that hard. You don't need discerning the spirit. You need two eyes with observational brain. You look at it. If you have it, it shows up. If you don't have it, you can't find it. You can advertise it. You can get 40,000 prophecies of idiots telling you that you have it. But if you don't have the fruit of it, the whole bunch of you are nuts trying to create something that's not been granted. And somehow I just trust God that he's smart enough to know what's what and to shut up and be a nice sheep in his pasture and eat grass. Just do what you're called to do, put your head down and do the job. So when he called me, I was thrilled that out of all these people, he asked for me to do something unique and special for him. So I said, yes, but I, I was a little aware of what that meant. That meant, oh, I can't play basketball. I can't do all the things my friends do. I have to be a little different. Not that I'm better than you or I think you're a bad person. He asked me to do something that requires me to make a different shift, to walk down a different type of life that you're living here, but just perfectly fine, perfectly good for how God's called and placed these other people. But for me, he asked. He says, what a call. When a call comes and you say yes, there's a, sh there's a shift. You start having a separation unto and when you separate until you can't do it with an attitude that I'm better than everybody else. It should be an attitude of, I can't believe. 
I get to do this for Jesus for a lifestyle. Wow. It's not a career choice. It's not a career choice. It's a calling. So in a career, you retire. In a calling, you die doing it. Not because you have to, because you really like it. And that's a little bit of difference between what I call career ministers and those that accepted the call. They don't quit. They may re-administrate what they do through the season, of the, but they stay. I had Oral Roberts in my office. I think I told this too, but it's worth telling again. He was in my office preaching at my church, and, and uh, I was, he came early, so he was in my office by himself, and I was running around the building to make sure everything was ready for the Pope to show up. And so he'd already showed up, and he was sitting in my office, so the little FBI guy goes, Pastor, he's in your office. So we, we all run, you know, thank God for FBI walkie-talkies. And so we, we, I would go to the office, and I'm kind of out of breath because I'd go up the stairs and run down the hallway. And there he is sitting in the chair, and he opened and goes, I don't want to die first. I thought, well, I don't want you to die at all. I don't want to be the place where Oral Roberts died. <laughs> died home. Don't die in my office. Don't die in my church. I don't want to be that place where Oral Roberts, he died right there. I don't want that. I think those kind of thoughts. And um, so I was first like, what's he talking about? So I just kept quiet. He goes, and, and if, if I die first, I have so much life still ahead of me. So I, I, and if I, if I die last, then I'm alone. I thought, is this your sermon today? What, 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 what? I mean, I don't know what scriptures were going on or what vein were like. He goes, I think I want to die kind of in the middle of everybody. I said, okay. And he was processing how to finish his life. He didn't want to die first because he still had life for Christ and life with his family and his friends. But if he outlived everybody, then he'd be alone. Actually, that's what happened, actually happened to him. He said, I want to die in the middle. That way I still live a little bit, but I'm not alone. That's the way a great man thinks. He never said, I wanted to quit. He never said, I'm going to retire. He's just trying to find out how he's going to exit earth. That's how they think. A calling has no retirement. It's refinement and readministration to the end. So when you accept the call of God, it's for life. So all your friends may retire and come to Florida where I live and go fishing and, you know, eat the four o'clock old people meal and then be in bed by seven. If that's what, well, somebody got it. But that's what they do in Florida. All the restaurants are about four or five o'clock. So if you outweigh all the old people, they'll be gone. And then you can go in there and have a meal yourself with your friends. There's like four young people in my town and I'm one of them. I'm middle-aged. So, you know, uh, but that's, that's the way they live. But you won't live like that. Your friends will not really be your age group at that time. They'll be me and you. Young ones, middle-aged guys that are still going, they'll be your friends. So you're going to have to accept that when you accept the call of God, your, your lifestyle cannot be compared to the secular world. All right? Hold that thought and let me go down this vein for a moment. How does the kingdom define success? Success in life, in, in secular life, is how much money you have, how big the stuff you have that you own, how big it is, how wonderful it is, and all those things. And that's how we look at Oprah, Miss Oprah. She's the only one, I think, in American history that bought a house for $50 million with a check. She walked into the house in California when she's leaving Chicago and said to the real estate agent, do you take a check? And she goes, yes, and she wrote a 50 some million dollar check and bought the house on a check. Now, that's called success, according to the world. Oprah's a little crazy in the head, but she's successful. She needs to go back to that Baptist church and learn who's who and what's what again. She's been out in L.A. drinking the wrong Kool-Aid. <laughs> she started sipping in Chicago. Now she's really drinking bad in California. And you look at some of the movie stars and, you know, the, the big business people. It's wonderful. Now, I'm not a poverty preacher, but I do think we're going to have to be a little careful because sometimes we come into success 
in ministry the way the world looks at success. The kingdom of God first declares success this way. Did you do what I told you to do? Write this down. Did you do what I told you to do? Did you finish it? Did you finish what he told you to do? Now, what he told you to do may not have a camera in front of it. You may never be on a a Charisma magazine cover. You might never hit any publicity. But the kingdom of God does not register that as a part of you being successful. The secular world does that, and the carnal Christian thinks that way, but not the spiritual ones that are really doing the call. Is Did you do what I told you to do, and did you finish it? Did you finish it? I think it's John 17. Let's go over there real fast. Let me find this verse for you. John 17, if I can find it. I'm so old school, I do all mine. Bible reading from the actual Bible. John 17, 4. Jesus said, I have glorified thee on the earth. And he said to the Father, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Not everybody finishes. And I'm going to make a a privately public statement. Less than half finish. Everybody starts. And there are reasons why people don't finish. One, they never determine to finish. Within themselves, I will do this if I get this. There, there's like a negotiation that goes on that needs to die. In the call of God, when you're here, there is no plan B. It's only plan A. You either sink or swim on the yes of the call. And you do it right or you suffer for it. I don't have a plan B, really. I am what I am. If I ever wanted to quit, I don't... How can this weird guy do another something else? I'm so tuned into my call to what I'm doing. I can't run around and talk about dead presidents. I don't know their story. And I don't really trust any of them. I do admire a few of them, but I don't trust any of them. But I, 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 I gave myself to my calling. All of it from a little boy. I've gone so far, I can't quit. I don't know how to quit. I've been working at this since I was a little boy, so the working mechanism just keeps on working. My body may be exhausted, but it keeps on working. My brain may be bleeding and dying, but it keeps on working. That thing just keeps right on working. And I'm glad it works in me like that. But success in ministry is found on, did you finish? Did you finish? Jesus makes the comment himself on his earthly ministry to the Father. I have finished the work which you gave us me to do. So while you're in Bible school here and you're reading some of the stories and you're looking at the the generals and other people that come through the school and the church here, look at the ones that have a determination to finish. Hang out in their world. Get their CDs. Be in that atmosphere. Those that are going to finish. That's how God rewards you. In, In... the days of the first great awakening, the colonial days of America, there was a guy named George Whitfield. You all know who George Whitfield is? I, I think I talked about him one day here. Or so uh, he's a cross-eyed preacher from Great Britain that came over to America. And he was called to come to America. John Wesley and him were friends. And um, John Wesley came to America and didn't have a real good time here because he wasn't called here. George Whitfield was called here. He got here and within 30 days, he packed out the church where John Wesley tried to preach and pack it out and couldn't even get it half full. He had it packed out and he became the most popular man in colonial America, more famous than the, the founding fathers. And he would go around in his crusades and he'd preach and have this, what we call prophetic statement. This shall be one nation under God. He said it so much that it became a part of our nation and our mottos. It came from George Whitfield, a cross-eyed evangelical preacher. He went, this nation shall be one. We won't be like Europe, have four or five countries or 15 countries. We shall be one nation, and this nation shall be under the authority of God. He preached it and prophesied it enough to where it happened. 
Now, we got to keep prophesying that or we're going to all get crazy. You all better start prophesying that word that Whitfield preached way back in the day. We shall remain one nation under Jehovah. And so he, 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 um, he came and he blasted through and helped America become Christian. Now, right on the same time that he came, there were hundreds of couples and single people in Europe and Great Britain that had a burden for the new world for Jesus. And they came to the new world bringing their anointing, their gifting at God's command. Go to North Carolina, go to Georgia, go to Virginia, go to Maine, wherever they went. And there were probably thousands of them over that time, but I'll say hundreds to be safe. Hundreds that came on boats like Whitfield came, but they weren't known for what they did. The fruit of what they did helped found America's Christianity all over the nation. So there today, there are churches that were built by Whitfield. There are churches built by some of the first Methodists, the Baptists, and, the, and there, there are these old churches in the middle part of these towns. And there's, a, there's a, a remembrance because there's a remaining of the actual physical work. Most of the people that helped Jesus and George Whitfield make America Christian, we do not know their name. We have no knowledge of where they actually labored or where their church may be. Today, it could be a parking lot. It could be the foundation of a hospital. It could be a school. It could be a cornfield. We do not know, but they came and they labored and they worked as hard as Whitfield did in their call and died in the same era. When they got to heaven, we think sometimes because Whitfield was famous and Whitfield is recognized and he had the greater voice and the greater ministry compared to the others in size and momentum that the other ones weren't as important. Jesus never looks at anybody like that. You have to know that because people will look at you like that and you will assume that the heavenly father is looking at you like all these other people. And you have to know in yourself how God sees you and not let people's attitudes and opinions and their disposition affect how you obey and how you think of yourself and what you do. Because they can discourage you from not to continue. Because look at that cross-eyed preacher. He does all the things he's told not to do and he gets the crowds in the, and in the newspaper. Me and my wife and my babies have been working here for 20 years and we got 40 people and they're all hostile. And you can get discouraged and quit. Jesus does not look at you and compare you to others. He, com he compares you against what he told you to do. And the time that you have left to finish it, he'll speak to you. He does not reward you because of the size, the fame. He rewards you according, did you finish what I told you to do? I'm going to tell you a story. The most amazing moment of a Christian leader I've ever seen. It's a big deal to me. Kenneth Hagin is who I'm going to talk about. I, I'm a Haganite. That means I love him a whole lot, okay? And I would encourage you all to read his book and get his CDs and get that message of faith in you. He's a good brother, good man of God. I've heard him preach more than anybody else in my life. So I know we lived about three or four miles from Raymond, Brother Hagin's headquarters. So I grew up, I can preach his sermons almost better than he can. I can preach them now. You won't even know it's him because you haven't never seen him. You'll think, oh, that's a good sermon, Brother Robert. I hijacked it from Brother Hagin. I can preach dead people's sermons too. You just don't know when I do it. Here's a little advice for you. If you don't know what to preach, memorize some of the old dead guys. William Boo, some of the wiggles. Go get some of those sermons and memorize it because you're going to be come a time and you're like, I don't know what to preach. Preach their stuff. Just change the story, make it updated story, but keep everything the same. They'll think you're deep. 
They're like, oh my God. And I'm like, thank you. That's how you get around the day you don't know what to preach. I like preaching booth sermons. William Booth sermons are great sermons. But I was in a service with Brother Hagin sitting out in a crowd, and he's been the leader of the Word of Faith revival now for, what, 15 years or so. It's uh, kind of that time period in the move. And um, we, we all have confidence in him. He's lived right. He's preached doctrinally correct. He has stayed right in the spirit. He's gained the status of what I would call the, the foremost prophet of his time. He was a world prophet of his time. Whether you liked him or not, when he prophesied, we all heard what he said. It went around the world in about 30 days. So even dark Africa heard it and crazy Asia heard it. it. He was that kind of prophet. So whether you liked him or not, when he said, and the Lord says, shoom, it would fly. And so we all were comfortable following him as he follows the Lord. So we were very happy just to follow Brother Hagin. You're going to follow somebody. Make sure the somebody is a good somebody. All right? And so we, we were all, I was waiting, and we were singing songs in those days, which you probably would not know, but there was one I remember called, It's Beginning to Rain. It's a nice little, little song. It's beginning to rain. It was like the latter rain stuff. So it was our revival song, you know, the, the, you know, the prophetic revival song. Ours is a lot more exciting today. I mean, look what Joshua did today. He just sang a brand new song. We didn't do that back then. We had to write it and learn it and teach it and sing it. Today, you just, and you have something. So much more fun. Especially if you could do what Joshua does. I don't know how to play. And I only sing by faith. <laughs> Notice I have no CDs of music I have out there. <laughs> That's not my gift. Know what your gift is, but it's the next point. But, but he, he got up, and, and Brother Hagin was very good, because a, a, a revival leader has to be a correctional leader, a person that corrects. If you don't correct, you're not leading properly, or you shouldn't be the, the, the point personalities. I look at some of the people that either are leading different things, and I'm thinking, bad leader, nice, but bad leader. You don't tell anybody Stop it or do this. You don't, you don't. If you're going to be the top guy, you're going to have to correct through teaching and through demonstration and sometimes rude confrontation. That's the last resort, but it is in there. And so Brother Hagin, I heard many times get up and correct all the, what they call the hyper faith, because there were some hyper faith folks. I lived in Tulsa. I was born there. So it got so bad, people writing hot checks, they were called faith checks that the bankers, because Brother Hagin was very popular and famous in town, and a lot of them were Christians and went to his meetings, pulled him aside or his son aside and said, listen, our banks can't allow Rama students to open checking accounts because as soon as we know they're a Rama student, we have to put a check on them because there are so many bouncing checks that come from the student body that it's a reputation. Well, Brother Hagin didn't go, <laughs> I'm sorry. He, he went and spanked all the students. He said, I just, and, and, and he went up there and, and I was in that meeting too. He said, now if you write a check without any money in the bank, you should be fined. If you keep doing that, you should go to jail. And I'll help them put you in there. <laughs> well, because he would get upset because it misrepresented Jesus first. The ministry that he had built over his life of being what he was and that. So he said, now you all stop that. That's not faith. Then we had another thing go through the faith camp, casting calories out of food so you don't get fat when you eat stuff. Now, I wish that worked. Anybody else? I wish that worked. But I tried it, and it still don't work. So it won't gonna work for you either. It's called self-control and discipline is how you work that one. It don't come out like, I command sugar to die in Jesus' name. Carbs, leave my plate, go somewhere else. That, that's not going to work. But they were doing that Sin, with a sincere stupidity. But they were sincere about it. Sin, sincerely wrong. I'll say it politely that way. So I, we, we grew up with that, and I watched him correct things. I watched him answer critics that would come against him, like Jimmy Swaggart came against the faith camp and Brother Hagen and Brother Copen because he thought they were hyper. What brother made Brother Swaggart? Now, I'm, I'm a Swaggart guy. I like him. But because I, I'm in class, I talk all the sides, okay? Because welcome, that's the way ministry is. It's amazing. Mother Edder was asked and her team to go see Sister McPherson preach. And Mother Edder said, 
I don't like her preaching. She's too dramatic. And I'm like, and what are you? <laughs> Miss Boring. I mean, you fall into a trance. You do, I mean, hello. So, you know, it's human nature. Amy's too dramatic and you're boring, I guess. All right. So, it, it, you know, it's just, it's just the way life is. And to me as a historian, it's humor. It's the it's part of the humor of all the stories and the personality. I always thought the two ladies should have gotten together and had a camp meeting together. Think of Amy and Mother Edder. That would have been a humdinger of a meeting. Talk about crowds and trances and Amy and healing. We, we could took over the whole West Coast in one afternoon. So quit fussing and start working, working together. Find ways to hook up and work together for Jesus. Side note, corporate anointing is more important to you than it was 50 years ago. Because of the challenges of the day, it takes corporate anointing to get victories in most situations, not a singular anointing. But Brother Hagin, and, and so he corrected all these, and, and, uh, and so he got up and he said in this sermon, or this actually had a talk with us, he talked about the move of God he saw coming, talked about a vision he had about it. And he, if you he knew how he talked, he, he would talk for 20, 30 minutes and kind of build the story and take you on a little journey like a teacher would to get to where he wants to go. So you had to kind of go with him. And he normally would hold his hand and twiddle his thumbs and kind of shuffle his feet while he would talk. And if it was real hot, he'd flip his jacket like that to cool off like that. So, you know, that's what he would do. So he was doing all the little things. To learn. And then he stopped because now, the reason why I told you all of this to get you where I need to say this tonight I'm not going to lead the next move. That's not my job. I was called to go teach people faith. That was the revival that we're in right now. But there is another one coming. I am not called to lead it. And some of you are waiting for me to take that position to run. Tonight I'm here to tell you, run on, boys. Run on. Get out there in front of me and run because I will die fulfilling my call, teaching faith. He goes, I will participate in the move of God, but I'll not lead it. I'll be a part of what God is gonna do, but as I'm in it, I must continue to teach faith. That's my call. I can't get out of it. He said, and plus, I'm not called to lead any other move. I was called to spearhead. The faith move was called, and he was but I'm not called that. I saw a man who was at the height of respect, at the height of that revival, tell everybody in the world, I'm not the next guy to lead. He just removed the whole thing out of his sphere. That's called a man without an ego. I saw that day something I've never seen since. I hope to see it again in the right hearts and times. A man staying in his calling, happy to do what he was called to do, and not going to be moved out just because he could take it. And thousands, hundreds of thousands would have followed him. But he'd have been out of his calling, out of where God had positioned him, and out of the flow of the grace and the anointing over his life would begin to wane. He still had a degree, but it would wane. You don't want the anointing to wane as you get older. You want it to get stronger. You want it to get powerful. You want to go out and blaze of glory like, oh, look at how good. And that's what Hagen did. But I, 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 I count that one of the most significant meetings of a leader in my life. I've never known. There might have been, but I've never known. Anybody else to stand up at the height of their fame, their influence, their position, and tell all of us, I'm not called to lead the next move. I'll participate in it. I'm called to teach faith, and I will die fulfilling my call. I'll be a part of it. Now, notice, he didn't say he'll stay on the outside of it. Now, some people... They'll just quit and disconnect from the body, from the moves that's going on. And God didn't call you to disconnect and leave. He just repositioned you. And Brother Hagin knew, I'm not going to remain the top voice, but I'm going to remain in the move of the Spirit. 
whatever the Spirit is doing, I'm going to have a place in it. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to participate. And I'm going to finish my calling in it. Now, I've said that three times. Have you got it? Do I need to do it a fourth time? When, I, when, when you get it, I feel it. Some of you are still perking. You're perking because you're still in your first diaper. You haven't got over into your britches yet. That's why you're just, you're just trying to get ready to run. I'm talking about a guy that's finishing his race. I'm sowing a seed that when your hair turns one color, it all falls out. You'll know what to do at that time. Because most people don't talk to you like this. Because most people talking to you still want the point position. I'm doing my second part of life because I don't want to be old and bored. And I don't want to be a guy in the stands trying to give everybody advice what to do. I might not be the quarterback, but I want to at least be somebody on the field knocking somebody over. I want to still want to participate in it. So you all run and I'll run with you. I might be a little behind, but I'm a coming. You got a diaper, I got britches, I'll help you change. When it's time, I'll help you change and, and walk a little bit better. Did you enjoy that little story? Did you, did you get, get to the point? And, 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 and if you're around somebody that does that that, that, that should trigger something in you. It should trigger a different respect level. Almost that day, my confidence in who Brother Hagin was in the Lord and in my life in the Lord went to a new place where he's dead now, but he still sits in my heart. And who and what he is and how he did still helps guide certain aspects of my life today. And I like it. I kept opening doors because of how they lived and what they did. When I'm real old, I hope I can do what he did. So, well, I obeyed. You all lead. I'm coming. I might walk a little slow, but I'm a coming. I have a cane that we call a staff. If you don't get right, I'll hit you with it. God called me as a little boy. He said, there'll come a day when gifts will be few and them that have them will know not what to do. In the days that you'll see, the gifts will be misused and I will cause them not to be as fruitful as I desire. Then there will come on the horizon a new group and in there they will be more authentic and he used the word authentic, which is one of these present day words. They'll be more authentic and they'll be easier to lead than your generation. I think this is you people. I, I, I do think it's this generation, this, 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 this group of people. And, 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 you know, he gave me that word when I was 12 years old. I never tell all of it because it takes too long and it's none of your business. <laughs> Some things are just sacred, you know. And you can only say certain things if it comes by unction. You all still with me? I'm getting floaty here for a moment. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise Lord. The gifts and the calls are without repentance. You got to stay within your calling. Now, staying in your calling is difficult when you get halfway into it or get, become successful. The enemy of the high call is a lot of good things. The, the, the high calling and the, the gift and the call that God gives you sometimes is left undone by you doing many good things. When I pastored in California, I had a couple thousand people and we were that church in Orange County that kind of led at that time. And uh, we, we call them gatekeepers. I don't like all those words because it gives you titles and mental impressions that I don't have to deal with when I go home by myself. I just want to call, I obeyed the Lord. Keep the verbiage simple so your brain don't have all these images you got to deal with. And that's, that's why I keep my mind kind of renewed on certain things. Like I don't let, I, I know what those words mean, but I just don't let them get in there because it builds imagery and builds emotional things that you're going to have to deal with later. And I'd rather not have to deal with it. And so uh, we, we had people in the church that, you know, when you have a church of 2,000 people, everybody wants to do their thing with your money. Thank you, pastor. <laughs> so you have to navigate, is it really the Lord or is it, you know, something, and you have to navigate. And I realized that God had called me to lead that church to do certain things, spiritually and naturally, to build a school with it, 
and to ship all the people that graduated. We had a three-year school. The first two years are like yours. Third year, we shipped you overseas and paid for it for a year. We shipped junior family to a foreign country. And, and I know most of them weren't called to be missionaries, but the worst day of your life as a Bible school student is the day you graduate. What am I supposed to do now? That's a, that's a tough moment. So I made it easy. I shipped you for a year and paid for it. All you had to do is just pack your bags, get your wife, get your kids, get your dog and go. And so that, that's what we did. So we shipped them all over the world. We had called Operation 500. So we, we were certain things we were called to do. Now, there was a couple in our church that had a few friends in the church that wanted us to build and to participate in unwed mothers' homes, that we should buy a house or rent a house for unwed mothers and, and get involved in that ministry. Well, I believe in that ministry. I don't have any negatives about it. They need help, especially at that time in their life. And so they, 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 they kept coming at me, yeah, you're going to do this. It was gonna, you know, if I was going to buy a house or, or do something, it's going it's to cost some money. I had it. It's nice to have it, but you, just because you have it don't mean you get to manage it. God still manages the money even though you hold it. You're the steward of it. Okay? And, um, and so they got all mad at me. Me don't like unwed mothers. I said, when did I ever say that? I didn't say that. Well, you're not doing nothing about it. And that really bothered me. I thought, because they were nice people in my church. They weren't cuckoos. They, well, I was going to say they became cuckoos, but they weren't cuckoos at that moment. You know, people become flakes. I had a sermon called How Flakes Are Born. You should get it sometime and learn how flakes are born so you can spot them and don't become one. And so... Yeah, for real. And then I have a tape called, the, this tape is wild, because that was the best title I had for it. So um, have fun with that. But uh, they got all mad. And they're going, I'm going to leave this church. You're not obeying them. You don't have the heart of Jesus. So do I have Lucifer's heart? Well, what kind of heart do I have? You don't have the heart of Jesus. So I went back in to, to home that day, and, they, and they, you know, they always catch the pastor after Sunday morning church where your spirit's open. Have you been preaching for an hour? That's the most vulnerable point of a minister's moment is when they've been giving out of their spirit and they're not quite closed back up and they're still, and mean words and darts can go, boom, right into your heart. And so that's why you have to know how to protect yourself and understand how the anointing works on you so the enemy can't put a dart through somebody's words or attitudes in you. And uh, so she, they, they, put, they put a dart in me. So I went home and I was all, mm, had a great service. I couldn't see how good the service was because of what happened. And I said, Lord, what am I supposed to do? He said, do you like unwed mothers? I said, well, the few I know I do. I have no problem with them. I understand the situation and I'm not there to judge the situation. I'm there to help. And he goes, yeah, that's, that's, that's your heart. He said, I, did I tell you to do that? I said, and all the things I can remember, you never mentioned at all. He goes, I did not tell you to do that. That is not your calling. Those are somebody else's callings. I said, well, Lord, then what am I supposed to do? I believe in the ministry and we do need that ministry in our community. He says, how much money you got? And I named the figure. He goes, why don't you give half of it to the, those who are called to do it in town and sow a seed from your church once a year or monthly. He goes, I left it up to me. And support it. He said, you can take your money and support many things without leaving your calling. And I got delivered that day from all the good things that people want to do that are, I believe in, but I wasn't called to do it. I could, I could lend my, my, my popularity as the pastor once or twice a month and do a special offering for these certain types of ministries. Or I could just put them on the list that we're going to sow every month from our church into this ministry and, and let the church know that we're supporting this this way. And I saved myself a lot of trouble to where I could finish and keep doing my calling, finish the work he called me to do while being a blessing to others and not coming out of my call to do good things that I wasn't called to do. Did you get that? Yes. Now, money is a wonderful tool. Ecclesiastes says money answers all things. And it can answer your heart to do good things that you're not called to actually do. That's right. That's really, yeah. Let me say that again. 
Money, Ecclesiastes, I forgot the actual, but you can look it up. It says money answers all things, all right? Money has answering power. When you want a hamburger, money answers that. When you want to go to Africa on a mission trip, money answers that. Money has answering power to it. It answers it. You, you use this, this exchange, this tool of money to answer things. And so that desire to help unwed mothers or to feed the hungry or to help the hurricane victims or whatever it is, you know, to help the leukemia society, whatever it is that you want to be a part of that's good and right, that you would like to help, but that's not your call. Your money can be a part of you saying, I, I got to obey my call, but I believe in your ministry that Jesus gave you and I can give you some of what I have as I respect you, I believe in your calling, and I want to support it, and I want you to do this on behalf of me and my church and make that donation. It can be a one-time thing or however you want to do it. But use your money to answer the good things that you want to do that you're not called to do. Does that make sense? All right. Don't get out of your calling. And I've seen many pastors... Many ministers get out of their calling, not because they're in sin, not because they're, they're wicked, or they're, but they, they want to help everything. See, that's the Jesus part of you. We want to help everybody, but you can't. You've got to have a little smarts about it. And that's why we have a body. Yes. What the finger does, the toe does different. So people are called to be different parts of the body. Recognize and discern the body. Don't give your money just to folks you don't have the call for. That's all a waste of money. Make sure when you do give your money to these things, it's people who God has called them to do that like he called you to do what you're called to do. That same, they're going to be there through hell and high water, good times and bad. That's their call. Support those. That's called good ground. Good ground. And don't lose, uh, don't lose yourself in doing good things. Remember, God has many membered body. You may not know the person yet that's doing the good thing you want to support. They'll come, just ask the Lord, where is that person at? Or where is this group at? What, help me find the right person that's doing this as a calling that I can support. He'll help you. It may take a couple of days or a little bit of time, but you, you'll find it. Because a lot of times, I say it for a third time, good things pull you out of your calling and don't let good things. Now, if he called you to go sell drugs on the street, you wouldn't do that. He, if, he, if he called you to go do all these bad things, you'd go, no, he, he, he can't tempt you like that, but he can tempt you like, you better, you better go do this and Jesus wants to die for this. And da, da. All those things are true and Jesus wants to help these people and almost make you feel guilty because you don't go do it. You got to stand up to that. And you got to watch because some people seem to be anointed by the devil to hinder you. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's like there are folks who just hinder you, and then there's some folks who really do it well. They're like they're anointed by the devil to cause trouble in your life. You spot them, know who they are, and don't bow to them. If you can, kick them out. They're usually on the verge of wolf life if they're not already there. They're. Well, praise the Lord. Everybody get that point on the, on the call. Now, the other thing that happens that pulls people out of their callings is you being passed by while others run on down the road and it all just seems to go really good and they, like, well, what's wrong with me? And they keep passing you while you're on this road of obeying the call of God and you got your friends and you got everybody and, and their church is growing and yours is barely breathing. And, and, and it's like, watch them, and, and you get passed by. You know what I mean by it? They pass, as they're running the race, shoom, and shoom, and pretty soon you're like, I'm still running. Why can't I be in this group? So let's talk about that. Some people pass you by because the people they're called to don't have as much problems as the people you're called to have. That have. That's really a big deal. God kind of gives people with a kind of like my kind of personality, rough people, because we can just look back at them and fight and not give in. Some people aren't as mean as me. They're too nice. One, one glare and their whole world falls apart. Well, that don't bother me. That just warms me up to fight. I come from a fighting family. 
If you're ever in a battle, you want to layer it on your side because we don't give up. We fight or die in the process. Grandma used to say, we're going to win or die in the process. And that's the way she lived. And that's the way it's in me. So when you're in trouble, you won't want to meet one of my family on your side because you will not die. There might only be two of us left, but we'll come through bleeding and limping, but we'll win. We'll win. You got to have the, trust people that limp. They've gone through something. People that have gone through something know how to fight just a little bit better than folks who haven't gone through much yet. I was told that by one of my pastor friends, Dick Burnell. He goes, Brother Roberts, because I asked him, he's pastor this big church in San Jose, and I just started my little bitty church, 300 people. We're all happy, young people screaming, yelling. Didn't know much of anything but how to be loud. But we were happy, loud people. You know, if you don't know what to do, just be loud. That's scriptural. Ha! Just be loud. You'll make the devil mad, make all the religious people mad. At least you'll have that going on. And so, <laughs> things I did when I was young, because I didn't know. The problem now that I know, I wish I didn't know. That's why when the Lord says to do this, it's like, really? Because I know what that means now. I know what it takes. I know what it, the reaction may be because I have did some of it before. So it's like, that's, that's the problem of being older. You have that problem. Like, Jesus, I love you. But can we negotiate to have somebody that has no sense to do this? Because I know what this means. Half of these preachers in town are going to hate my guts. <sighs> But that's, that's a different story. Y'all still here? Yeah. All right. So, uh, where was I? <laughs> oh, pass you by. All right, that's it. I get over here and get in my soul. And I get out of my spirit flow and I forget where I'm at. <laughs> Don't leave the flow. Then you act like you have a bad memory. But uh, people pass you by. And that, that happened a lot to me. I thought, you know, Rod Parsley and I are peers. That's my generation. We kind of grew up around Brother Summer all together. Well, I'm going all over the world preaching in all these places. Everybody thinks it's great. It's not. Everybody thinks it's why. Wow, well, you're going to this country. You're going to that. Well, yeah, I'm in the country, but I'm not there on a holiday. I'm there laboring and preaching. I'm sleeping in the bedroom with all the pastor kids in the bunk bed. And I'm the guest evangelist. In America, I got three, 4,000 a night I'm preaching to. I got 45, and I'm sleeping in the Scottish bedroom with the pastor's kids, and my brain goes, you're crazy. What are you doing over here? I'd come back, and I'd see Rod. And I'd hear this big old World Harvest Church on, on steroids. I mean, screaming through America, having a great time. And Rod Parks is one of the best when he, when he preaches. My God. He can grab that microphone, and he's going to go ahead and get saved. You're going to get saved. You're going to die there, there in that pew. He's one of those good gospel preachers. And, and, and shoom, he passed by. And I thought, Lord, why? Why am I being passed by? He's, I didn't call you to build a church like that right now. I said, why not? All my friends are. <laughs> like your friends are supposed to dictate your life. I said, all my friends are building nice churches. He goes, you'll build a church that will be right now stay in the nations. I said, I'm in Scotland in the bunk bed with the preacher's kids. Rod is in a mansion in a big church with a microphone that works. Their my sound system sucks. <laughs> it don't even work right. Why am I in the middle of this little podunky town anyway? He said, because I'd go. I almost said, well then go. <laughs> but I didn't quite say it because that'd have been very, 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 very rude to Jesus. I think he heard I thought it but at least I didn't say it. And you'll go through little things like that. And I had to learn that my call put me down different roads than some of my other friends. And then I also learned I was willing to do my call when others started saying no at certain parts of their calling. And they'd pass you by. They pass you by because your call may be different than theirs. They pass you by because the people that you're called to minister to needs more work than the folks that they're dealing with. Now, there's nothing wrong with their people, nothing wrong with them, but it's, you have to understand you, where you're at. That kind of thing. 
Now at 56, I'm glad I went to Scotland. I'm glad I went and ate weird food in India. I've ate monkey. Mm-hmm. And thanks to Africans, I've ate a lot of other things. I didn't know what it was. I remember the scripture verse, don't ask for conscience sake. And I practiced it. I ate and, and went on many fasts all of a sudden. <laughs> and had my granola bars packed in my best suitcase just in case I got hungry because I couldn't eat whatever they were serving. And I went places. They gave me no money. They put me in places that I wouldn't put anybody. Filthy, dirty. Sometimes the water didn't work. Sometimes the lights would not work. So we didn't have cell phones in those days. So you had to know how to move around in the dark by faith. All those things. Jesus told me one day, I did that because of the kind of body you had. And I needed somebody to go places that were difficult for me. And I was so glad that I did it. I went and spent two weeks in the Burmese jungle and preached to the, the, the village Karen people and preached to the military because the Burmese were killing the Karen people. They would shoot iguanas and barking deers, and that's what we'd have for lunch and dinner. They'd be in a canoe taking me down a little river, and they'd see an iguana and send an arrow, boom, and knock it out of the tree. I couldn't even see what was up there, and that was dinner. For two weeks, my body screamed for two weeks. My brain called me every dirty name you could think of. It cussed me out. It made think, it, it was mad that I was in the Burmese jungle bathing in a river. And when you're the only white guy, they all come down to see you bathe because they want to make sure your parts and their parts are the same parts. And so you go down to bathe. Everybody in the village comes to watch the white guy bathe. So after a while, I was like, hello, everybody. You, I lost all modesty when I was in Burma. I'm like, all right, it is what it is. And there were so many mosquitoes that would bite your face. It looked like I had chicken pox. So I preached all of them with chicken pox looks, you know, things. And in Iguana, and entertainment at dinner time was that the Burmese students, because there was a little school there and the, and the team we were working with, they would catch flies with their chopsticks by their wings while they were still alive. I do not know how they did. That was very entertaining. They would sit then they'd eat and chimp. I'm like, what? This has to be witchcraft. <laughs> Welcome to the world. So we, we, we preached in the school and we traveled and preached in the mountains and climbed them and went down. And, you know, I'm a city guy. I don't like walking very far. I like floating or being driven or riding something. But you have to do all that. My body hated me. Hated me. Had to sleep under a mosquito net. The next place I went when I came out of the Burmese jungle, I was flown to Singapore. You ever been to Singapore? This is the day I died tremendously. I spent two weeks in the Burmese jungle. Come out of it. Had a great minute. I mean, spiritually it was fun, but everything else was terrible. My body hated me. My brain was cussing me out. It was just my whole three parts were not in unity. They were all at war with each other. Spirit was happy, body, mind. That's what was, like you've never had it. Don't give me that look. You, you've had the same thing when it goes contrary. And so I fly to Singapore, which is like the New York City of, uh, of Southeast Asia. It's beautiful. Magn it's the cleanest country in the world. It's a manicured country. It's, a, it's, it's wonderful. It's one of my favorite places to go. A young lady by herself can walk down the streets of Singapore at three o'clock at night and not worry one bit about her safety. It's just, it's a beautiful, wonderful nation. And so I come out of the jungles. You got to come out of the jungles, get in the canoe, go up the, about four or five hours up the river, get in a little Toyota truck, which means you sit in the back and you bounce all the way into Mosat, Thailand, get in the airplane and go to Bangkok. And thank God you start seeing humanity and civilization and your body starts becoming a little happy. 
because at least you see things that you're eventually going to get to touch. And they put me on the plane. They fly me to Singapore. I get there at night. And there's about 150 Singaporeans at 1 o'clock at night outside the customs area with my face on a big stick with my face (laughs) bouncing up and down that I was coming to Singapore. Had a limo for me. And yeah, they, 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 the, the, the custom guy says, who are you? I said, you won't believe it if I told you. He goes, no, are you a singer? I said, oh, I'm not a singer. I said, you won't believe it. I said, I'm a preacher. Like a Christian one? I said, yes. Yeah, I don't believe it. And they'd welcomed me to Singapore. They took me to the tallest hotel at that time, put me in the presidential top suite that had five bedrooms. And it, 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 was, it was huge. Now, I'm one person. What do you do with five bedrooms? Monday night, you stay in the yeah. first one. <laughs> Tuesday night, you stay in the second one. And you just kind of work the whole room because it's your room. When I had breakfast or lunch brought to my room, a little butler come in and stood behind me and took care. Like, and two days before, I meet an iguana. Right. Barking deer and the village is watching me take a bath in the river oh while I'm getting chicken pox. The two extremes killed me that day. I lost the ability to have a preference over where I was. I could go be in the hut of Africa or the presidential suite in London, the Ritz Carlton. Doesn't matter anymore because those two trips killed everything about that. You all need to die. The sooner you die, the more fun you can have in life. As long as you're like, your body goes, I like this. My brain goes, I like you now. It starts kind of warming up to my spirit. I thought you lying part. You're just trying to, and my brain would say, you need to do this and not that. And it starts working in you to come back in control. And you don't want to go to, to Burma no more. You're better than that. You're, you're, you're famous. You, you, you deserve a decent offering. You got a staff. <laughs> And, 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 and you know, yeah, and you, got, you, and you have a, you have a three part war going on and Jesus came in with a big knife and killed all of them. <laughs> Just swacked them down with this prayer, bam. And I died to preference in that way. So I can sleep in the bed with the twins. I can live in the barn with the bears and the goats and the chickens or whatever comes through the door. I can go talk to the president of a country. It don't matter. You can be the wealthy. I bumped into the princess, the, the princess of Thailand by accident. See, when you don't care, God puts you places. If you care, you don't have these stories because it'll mean the wrong thing to you. I was coming out of the hotel. I was going to go preach at the Church of Hope in Bangkok, big old church there in Bangkok, and they talk while you preach. It's a weird, weird church. About 4,000 people. Why well, you preach? I tried to tell them to be quiet and they kept talking. It's the only church I've been to. Everybody whispers and talks while you preach and then amen and gives you a good offer. And I, it was weird. But I was going to that church. So I noticed there's little FBI kind of guys around the hallways and I thought, well, you know, whatever. You know, hotels do things. And um, so I had my little suit on. Back then you wore suits and ties and shiny shoes. And um, we didn't wear ripped jeans and have funky hair. We all looked like Jimmy Swagger. <laughs> and because that was the official look back then, all right? Y'all be happy where you live now because you can have more fun. And um, so I'm coming off the elevator. I'll get back to my notes in a minute. I'm coming off the elevator and there's beautiful knockout, gorgeous, like I'll marry you woman walk off the other side of the, of the hallway. And we were kind of walking there. I thought, ah, oh. I mean, I don't, you may be spiritual, but you're not dead. <laughs> when you see beauty, it's called good looking, good looking. Take it slow and take it all in. She was absolutely, wow. I thought, I'll marry you tonight. That gorgeous. So I didn't know who she was, but I just knew she was like, wow. So for some reason, the FBI agents didn't tackle me or push me aside. So we kind of get on the escalator going down the two, like the two flights. And um, I noticed there's the paparazzi and there's all, you know, but you, you get into that. That stuff happens in some hotels. So it's not a, it's not that big of a deal. Like, oh, somebody weird is here, you know. 
usually a rapper that looks like he came from the, the pile of trash out behind the hotel, down this gorgeous hotel hallway, and he looks like a, a filthy rag. But that's really what shows up in some of these countries. And uh, so I, you know, and so I come down and so, you know, I, I'm not going to just look at him. Hi. So I start talking. I want to talk to anybody. Just be nice and polite. Manners matter. If you want to go through doors, don't look like a bum and don't act like one. You, manners matter, folks. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You can't get through some doors looking like a bubba. You can't get through some doors with ripped jeans, even they did cost $5,000. You have to know how to dress and you have to know how manners and the way you speak and the way you hold yourself and the way you gesture and the way that you present, all matters. They don't teach that in Bible school. <clears throat> you learn that after you get kicked out of a few places and you figure out why. <laughs> you did, or nobody in the room is gonna talk to you because you don't really fit. And so, I start talking to her, and um, she goes, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm, I'm going to go preach the gospel over here at this church. Oh, you're a preacher. Well, she didn't say, oh, she, oh that's a preacher. I said, yes. I said, are you a Christian? She said, no. I said, well, let me tell you about him. And he just, <laughs> so on the way down the escalator, I'm witnessing to the princess of Thailand. Wow. And when I got to the end of the, uh, I wasn't done, so we just stopped and talked for a while. <laughs> All the people and the bodyguards are coming around. So when that happens, you just ignore everybody and you focus on why you were there. By this time, I knew she was somebody. They weren't there for me. They were there for her because they were photographing us. I didn't know who she was, but I had a Jesus moment. And I had to make sure I finished the moment. And that's how I witnessed to the princess of Thailand. Fun. But you have to die of wanting that. When you don't care, all the stuff happens for you. Amen? Yeah. Are you enjoying this? I know I'm supposed to take a break, but I've probably missed it by now. I'm going to go on. If you have to go to the bathroom, just go. All right? You still enjoying all this? I haven't even got past my, my, my first point. Let's go over for, <laughs> to Acts, um, let's see, um, Acts chapter 9. Let me touch this for a moment while we're on this subject. Am I blessing anybody? Yes. All right, just want to make sure there's something to us. I don't want to. In Acts 9, we have Paul's conversion and his calling that, come, that comes to him. I'm not going to read the whole story. You know the story how the God hits him with the lightning bolt. He falls to the ground, the whole bit. And then Ananias kind of gets a little nervous about going and praying for him because he knows that Paul has a reputation of putting Christians in jail. But then got to give Ananias credit. And he says, well, if you tell me, Lord, I'll go ahead and do it. I'll trust you. Good man, good Christian. He goes, and it says in verse 15 of Acts 9, and the Lord said unto him, go thy way, speaking of Paul, the Lord is talking to Ananias, speaking about Paul to him. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Paul had three parts to his calling. He was called first to the Gentile, the non-Jewish people. Secondly, he had a governmental call on his life to represent Christ in the political arena. And thirdly, he had a call to help the Jewish people, the children of Israel. That was Paul's calling. There is a law of first mentions that we have in Scripture, that what God says first is first, most important. What God says second becomes second and third, and we call the power first, second, third mention, how God states something. I believe there's truth in that. And I think the same way Paul's calling here is three parts. He is called to the non-Jewish part of the world, the Gentiles. Then he's called to the kings or the political arena. Then he's called thirdly to the Jewish people. 
Now, one of the reasons why people make mistakes in their calling is they get their calling out of order because of what they like or their preference. Now, I'm going to tell you the story, and you can read through the book of Acts and read it out for yourself a little bit later. But Paul was used by the Lord to confront the legalism in the Jerusalem church. You remember that story the first time he came and Peter and him resisted each other to their face? Wouldn't that have been a good video to see Paul and Peter go at each other? That would have been a good one. He said, I resisted him to his face for he was to blame. That's pretty bold for Paul who was killing Christians, now accusing the top guy, you're the problem here. <laughs> you gotta love the guys. I mean, it's a beautiful story. But then after a while, the Jerusalem church falls back into tradition, back into legalism, not the grace of the Lord. And so Paul heads back toward Jerusalem. He says over in Acts 19, and when he talks about this story, when he goes over to Ephesus, he says, in every town I went to, I was warned or I was told bonds and chains await me. He said, in, oh, let's, let's hold your place in Acts 9 and go over to Acts 19. Let me, let, let's, let's look at it together in the scripture. Acts 19. Um, let's see. Let me find it real fast. Verse 21, after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia uh, to go over to Jerusalem. Uh, and he was sent down, and I said, that's not the right, where's, let me find it here. That's not the right one. Oh, here it is. It's Acts 20. I'm sorry, I was over, wrong chapter. Acts 20. And let's see, verse 22. He's preaching to the believers, or the leaders of Ephesus. Behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me, except or save the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying bonds and afflictions abide me or wait me. Notice here, he says, in every town, every place he goes, big one or small one, trouble cometh, trouble awaits you, bonds and afflictions, a little advice. If you have this happen to you, every place you go for the next two or three days or two or three weeks, and they keep saying the same thing, not knowing what the last person said, God's trying to talk to you. He goes, in every city, not one or two, every city, I kept being told, trouble comes. When that happens, my God, stop. Go get you a Starbucks coffee and find a tree and go sit under it and ask the Lord while you drink your coffee, what's up? Because Lord Jesus, are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to tell me? Am I supposed to run from this? Am I making a mistake by going? Or are you just getting me ready to enjoy chains? Because everywhere I go, I keep being warned. When you're warned people, that's God trying to help you before whatever happens, happens either to give you the strength to go through it or to put on your tennis shoes and run, baby, run. The opposite direction. There is an art to run toward Goliath and take him out, and then there's a time to run from the enemy. And you gotta know when it's time to attack and a time to leave and not attack. And when you're a warrior person, your nature is always to attack, but you gotta hear if God's saying, don't do this, not now, don't go there because it's a nature in warriors just to go because we're used to breaking through and resistance doesn't bother us, but he sometimes is like, mm -mm -mm -mm. He's told not to, he goes, there's trouble. So Paul heads back to Jerusalem because he wants to go get them back out of their legalism. When he finally gets to Jerusalem, things he preached against, he now is doing. He's in ceremony. He's doing these things. The tradition, the religious tradition of that church leaders said, if you want us to receive you, do this Jewish tradition that you may be received. Paul broke what he was preaching and did the religious tradition to find acceptance that never fixed the problem because he made a mistake. He should not have gone to Jerusalem at that time. Why did he do that? If you go back to his calling, it's three things. Gentiles, 
kings and the Jewish people. He loved the Jewish people. He was one of them. He loved them, loved them. And he did not want to see them living in that bondage of tradition and ritual and all the stuff that Christ brought them out of. And so he was going to go back and help fix them. He put his love for the Jewish people above the order of his call and became a man that lived in jail for the rest of his time after this. You see, but he had to get to, he had to, get to Rome. Um, there are many roads to Rome. He could have went a different one. He could have stayed free and helped some new more churches before he had to go to Rome. One thing that pulls you out of your calling is getting the order of your call rearranged according to what you prefer. Does that make sense? Paul should not have put the Jewish passion him first. Don't get rid of it. Keep it third. But he moved it, which caused him to get into this situation. People get out of their calling because they reorganize how God called them. I'm called three things. I'm called to teach spirit life, the generals, and tell my heaven story. Three things. Those are the arenas of my call. Those are my arenas. Now, I can teach other subjects pretty good. I can write books on other subjects and they sell and bless people. But I can't let those things ever take place of these things in this order. Keep your calling in the right order. Don't let your preference rearrange it to what you like to be first and change what God said was first, second, and third. Does that make sense to everybody? That's a big one. That's a big one. That, that, that's a big one of why people mess up their callings. Hallelujah. Let's just pray in the spirit just for a moment. Can we do that? So bracante le vechi se bracasso brorum prebede si chi libere gindustu. Mana le ve casala locoso bada le vede chi sta bala la haie. Mana le se bracosoto fra bara le chesti chi sta banda le haie. Yes. Hallelujah. I'll do that now. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right. I'll go on. I want to talk about persecutions. Persecutions has come to the church in our time and it will never fade away. We're going to live with a degree of opposition that only certain times in church history will be able to relate to in similar ways. It's a modern persecution, but it's still persecution. Persecution hit Elijah in, in uh, 1 Kings 19 after he had a, one of his greatest meetings knocked out the prophets of Baal, called down fire and rain, and, and then Jezebel yawned toward his direction, and he went into depression and ran off and scared of his life. Now, there's three kinds of persecutions that you need to be aware of and deal with. And the generals got a, all, all, all three of them. And when I teach it, you'll get it. The first one is persecution because of ignorance. You're doing something that you don't know how to do any better. And what you're doing is creating an opposition to yourself or to your ministry. Persecution because of ignorance. Once you learn to do it better and you do it better, that persecution will fade away. Does that make sense to everybody? There are things that you start out doing in ministry that creates certain attitudes or people's re reactions to you. And it's not because you're doing anything. It's, it's all you know. You don't know any better. That's what you know. But when you know better and you do it, that persecution that's caused by ignorance will disappear. You don't do anything but do it better, do it right, do it correctly. Number two is self-inflicted persecution. You're doing stupid things that cause persecution. And you know that you're doing it, but you don't want to stop and fix it. And I call that self-afflicted persecution. Now, when you stop doing the stupid stuff, then that persecution will go away, all right? Let me give you two examples of that one. Let's talk about Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn in the early days had hair. 
Many here today don't have as much hair. Some of you can remember when he was on his TV show back in the days of the big crusades, he had what, that wavy hair, you know, that wave hair. And he was taking his jacket and throwing it on people, and hitting people and they're falling down and he's taking the microphone and go, and everybody falls over. Remember those days? We all loved it. It was great. It's called playing in the anointing. Right there now, that's playing in the anointing. It's playing. Now, some folks don't call it, oh, it's a move of God. No, it's, it's the anointing, but you're playing in it. It's fun to take your coat and go, whack, and 400 people fall over. Got a microphone and blow in it and scare half of them down. The other fall because of the spirit, you know. And, 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 and you can learn how to manufacture stuff. You got to make everybody fall down. I can tell you how to make everybody fall down. Everybody stand up, get real worshipy music, and everybody hold hands together in the air, and you touch one person, and they go down and pull all the rest of it, and it starts falling down. And that's how you get everybody to fall down. <laughs> See, when you've been in long enough, you know the tricks of the trade. <laughs> yeah, and, and you can scare some people to fall by using your microphone and blowing it and real, whoom, and that big boom, ah, and they fall over. <laughs> they didn't fall over because of the anointing, because, it was because of the loudness of the microphone. Mm-hmm. Well, I've seen that. I have too. And it's okay for a, to, to a point. Because I call that people are learning. And there's a season that God will let you play in the anointing. And Benny is a friend of mine, so I can talk like this. I'm not talking against you because we laugh about it and talk about stuff. And, and, um, and so he, he was with the hair thing. The jacket thing, and, whoo, and, whoo, and 4 thousand people fall, and, and then six thousand other fall because they fell over, and, and that's why you need insurance. <laughs> because when people fall in the flesh, they get hurt, and today they sue you. Yeah. And you know why people put their ministries in Texas? Because Texas law only allows a nonprofit to be sued up to a million dollars. It's capped. Other states, it can go further. So you'll notice. Some ministries have their headquarters yeah. in Texas. Now, I don't think there's nothing wrong with that, but that's why some of them are there. Because they do enough stupid stuff, they need the help. <laughs> are you? I hope you like me after this part of my message. <laughs> and so he's got his little hair, and, and everybody's talking. Now, the public's all talking about his hair. They're talking about his coat and blowing the microphone, people falling over, and people are getting healed at much all the stuff that's going on. And Benny's having a good old time. And most of the Christians are having a good time falling, getting up, falling some more. They're loving the whole thing. It's just, wow, it's great. It's wonderful. And it's great. So some of the older men, like Or Roberts and some of the older guys, were watching him. And they decided it's time to talk to Benny. So they go talk to Brother Benny. They said, Benny, fix your hair. Why was it my hair? There are too many people talking about it and not Jesus. Do you want people to think of your hair or Jesus? Oh, we want Jesus. Well, fix the hair. Well, it's my hair. I like it. Do you want to talk about Benny Hinn hair or Jesus that works through Benny Hinn's heart? So he fixed his hair. All right. Do you want to be known for the guy that blows on the microphone, they all fall down, and you take your jacket and hit everybody on stage and they all fall over? Is that what you want to be known for? No, but it's, it's the anointing. Yes, but what are you doing with the anointing? Because some people think, the anointing made me do it. Not really. Not really. There's a cooperation. There's a few times overpowering, but not as much as people say. They say that because they want to get away with it, and you can blame God because you can't find him. God made me do it. Well, who's going to find God? I mean, people say, well, the Lord told me to do this. Well, then how in the world can I give you counsel against what the Lord says? So when you say, the Lord told me, then I'm done. I have nothing more to say. So be careful how you use those words. You may shut down the counsel that saves your heart 
or gives you the right path to walk on. Learn how to talk right. To Benny's credit, he fixed his hair, stopped the jacket throwing, but once in a while he'll still do it and don't blow on the microphone all the time. Now, you can do that, but you'll not see the great generals play in those kind of manners, do you? Did you see Catherine going, whoo, Miss Kuhlman would never in a thousand years blow in a microphone to have half the crowd fall down. That would, she would be appalled by that. <laughs> no. Can you imagine Kenneth Hagin? Setting everybody up to fall down. Raise your hands and touch each other and woo, the glory clouds here. He would never. First, you don't have to do that. There is a plane in the anointing that you will grow out of. Sooner the better. Now, if you stay in these oddities, you will get a few miracles, but you'll gather a certain kind of crowd that you really don't want to be the crowd that follows you for a lifetime because you're going to have to keep pulling a new carrot out of the hat every six months. Okay? You want the authentic done in a way that there was no manipulation, no setup, Nothing but we do what the scripture tells us and the presence came and this happened. Does that make sense? Now, we are Pentecostals. Now, I love being tongue-talking Pentecostals. I love my tribe. But we do have some weird things in our, in our camp. Amen? Now, you have to decide, like Benny had to decide, and others have had to decide before him and after him. You're going to have to decide if you're going to pay the price for the authentic thing consistently. Or are you going to have a mixture? When you're in the mood to pay the price and the real thing shows up, but when it's not there, you have some type of manufacture. Now, if you've preached long enough and dealt with public crowds, you know how to move a crowd without the anointing. You'll learn that you'll learn the public dynamics. I can feel this room. I know what kind of people you are. I know what your buzzwords are. I know how to make you have a feeling. I can create the whole thing. And you'll think it's glorious. And 90% of it was me orchestrating an atmospherical put together to create that response. You have to determine if the glory's there and it's working, roll with it. But if it's not, what are you going to do? The crowd is expecting a certain type of presence manifestation because you're kind of known for that. But there are times it's not there. Like T.L. Osborne. You all know who Brother Osborne is. He, he tells the story. I actually, I interviewed him, and, and it was one that I said, you have miracles in all your service. He goes, no. Where'd you hear that? I said, well, every story I heard, he goes, I only tell you the stories where it works. He was so fun. He goes, I don't tell you stories where it's not happening. There's no thrill in that. So I was in I said, well, what happens when it don't work? He goes, well, here's what I do. And you imagine you got... 70,000, 100,000 people, they come to see the miracle man. And he gets up and preaches a miracle service and not anybody gets a miracle. And they all came expecting. He goes, you will feel the disappointment in the crowd. You'll feel the pressure of the crowd that came because they needed a miracle that night and it's not present. He said, I had to learn how to deal with that feeling. He said, I just tell them, come back tomorrow and we'll have miracles again tomorrow. We'll have miracles tomorrow. He said, I had a crusade. It took four nights to get the miracles to show up. I had to get up there and preach and pray and nothing happened for four nights. What would you do? How would you feel? When you're in front of a crowd 
that has an expectation for your prophetic gift. And tonight, there's no bubbling prophecies coming out of you. There's no prophetic wind coming through the building. What are you going to do? And there's people that want a prophecy. They've driven three hours to get a prophecy. What are you going to do? What some people do, they just manufacture one. And they create a prophecy out of their own spirit and not from the word of the Lord. It's the word of them. It's encouraging word. It's a nice word. It's not a bad word, but it's not the word of the Lord. What are you going to do? How are you going to handle a service where that which the people came for is not happening? And you look like the fool. Because no one can see Jesus standing on the stage. They just see you. And they hear your voice that's supposed to represent his voice. But he is not in the mood to do what he normally does with you tonight for whatever reason. And you're left there to figure it out. So you have two choices, students. You have two choices, preachers. Just to be honest and say, it's not here tonight. I can still, you can still pray for people with the law of faith. When there's not a gift or a present anointing like that upon you, you can still pray for people out of faith in chapter and verse. So you can still pray for the sick. You can still minister in that way. And that's appropriate and that's okay. But they didn't come for just a prayer line with a, with a prayer of faith. They wanted the other dimension of you. But sometimes you just have to tell them that. I've seen different men. The great, the great preachers will just tell you. Well, tonight, I mean, I, I, I wanted to flow this way, but it's not, it's not here. I, 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 want to, I wanted to minister in this particular way, but folks, I, I, I can't go beyond where the Lord has me. If I go out here and try to do this, I'm doing it in my own regard, and that's not what I want or what you want. And I've heard them just talk to the crowd for a few moments, just as we know it. I don't know why, but I can pray for you under the law of faith. It is his will to heal. And by faith, we can lay hands upon the sick and pray in the name of the Lord. And you can be healed that way. I, I will do that tonight. I'll have some of the pastors help me. And people will be prayed for, but it won't be the same di- dimension. And your crowd the next night will probably be smaller. And your offering that night will, will be smaller. So that's also pressures. Your crowd starts shrinking and your money gets lower. Oh, I got a big budget. Well, you better have been sown before you got to that meeting. Or you can do the other thing that they do. Manufacture it. Produce it. A false counterfeit. You, 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 can, you can do that. I don't advise that. That's wrong. But many of the meetings we've been into in the last 10 years in our prophetic streams and some of the, have been things that were manufactured more than authentically granted by the flow of the spirit. There's been times I'm like, folks, shut the meeting down. Save the purity of the hunger of the people. Do not disappoint and abuse and con the people. Don't con them. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because if you do it once, then you have a knack to do it again. And then pretty soon, you just go out and do the whole thing. I can produce a Catherine Kuhlman atmosphere. I know how to do it. I know how to get the right music. I know how to get to the right level of singing. And with enough memory in the room about her, I can create that, that thing, that natural thing, where people think it's the real thing. But I will know, I put it together. I'm the author. So all you can get is what the author can give you, which is not much. I can give you a good story. I can slap you around a little bit. But that's about all I got. If there's no anointing, we might as well go home and get a pizza and enjoy football. Because there's not going to be nothing. Are you all listening? And so people begin to manufacture something. 
in the world of prophecy, we have come to the point to where we don't know the unction of the Spirit versus just your spirit talking. And most prophetic words that are given are given from the human spirit's kind utterance. It's not evil, but it's not the word of the Lord. Now, I'm a little bit on the, I don't want to call it old school, but I guess that's what it is. I don't want your word. Keep it to yourself. I didn't drive three hours for your word. I could have stayed home. You could have called me over the phone and done that. I didn't come here for that. I'm glad you're nice and you're willing, but do the right thing. Well, they all want a prophecy. Well, give them a verse of the Bible and teach it to them. Well, they don't want it. They need to grow up. All right, hold my first song. Let me touch this. A crowd, when you're a minister, there's two demands when you walk into a crowd what God wants to do and what the crowd wants you to do. If you can get the crowd and God to be the same thing, you got a good thing going on. And that normally can happen in a mature church where the pastor and the leaders have matured the people enough to find what the will of the Lord is and they were sure enough to yield to it even if they have a preference and it's not their preference, they'll still go because they're mature enough to go with the Lord. If you get a church or a crowd like that, and you come in, you can have, I mean, you can have a Holy Ghost time because you're not having people pulling for themselves. They're mature enough to say, what is God? And they jump in, they just flow in support. Like I watch crowds today when I'm praying for individual people, not, you know, not everybody. I'm praying for this person, this person. What's the crowd doing? Now, what I see today, if it's not focused on me, how are you doing? How's your kids doing? And up there, there's ministry going, and you have a private conversation going on out here. And all of a sudden, you have a little prayer meeting going, and a little group of laughing over here. And all of it, there's a disrespect to the corporate flow. And that's why it stays low. When the Lord is ministering, we all need to stay participating and focused even when it's not on us. Now, that takes this because sometimes you've got to do that for an hour and a half and has nothing personally to do with you. Right. You're just there praying and worshiping, keeping the atmosphere high, high with faith and keeping it moving with the spirit. And you're part of just what is making the moment happen. And you have a need. Your kidney's upset. Your ear's not working or something's wrong. And, and you're like, I need a miracle too. But he's not focusing on you at that moment. He may not focus it all on you that at all in that service. And what we see today, and I want to challenge it and I want to rebuke it, that we have people that will start their own little talks and conversations and little groups of things, and they have their own little group, a little anointing, whatever they want to do over here, and it pulls, it pulls the corporate apart. It pulls the focus of heaven apart. And no one seems to think this is wrong. It is wrong because you're no longer following the Lord in that service. You're doing what your flesh wants to do. Some don't know better because the leadership won't correct anybody. Well, that's old school. No, it's not old school. It's Bible school. And that's why... Some of the old timers don't like this stuff. They don't like prophetic meetings. They think it's a waste of time because they'll come into a service and God will start working and then the audience will start going in four, five, ten different directions and the corporate anointing breaks. The, the cloud that habitated dissipates and it vanishes, and then it relies just upon the faith of the, what's happening up here, and there's no longer the presence there. If you want the deeper things in this school, in this church, in the church where you may go in the future and lead, you're going to have to put everybody know how to come into a unity of the faith and spirit from the front row to the back row. 
and how to stay active in a corporate situation where you're not the focus, but you are willing to be a part of what keeps the faith bank high through focusing prayer and staying active with that service and others you're glad to be a part of the operating room atmosphere so that they can receive a deeper work, a greater healing, a revelatorial impartation that needs to be done. But we have not received the deeper things of the Lord because the atmospheres of our meetings are not mature enough to handle a deeper work. The people do not do it. They destroy it. Everybody with me? When you're in a meeting, you come into it, what does the Lord want to do tonight? What is his bidding? What is his will? Now you will have in you what you have a need of or what you would like, but it has to be put somewhere down where it doesn't dictate your thinking, your focus, your attitude, what you want. And if I don't get it, then I'm going to leave or I'm going to talk to my friend or I'm going to start praying for people myself, which in my day, the ushers would carry you out. And I know that doesn't happen a lot, but it needs to happen some. Because some things we've now allowed to where everybody thinks we can do what we want and we call it the anointing. And you don't know you're drinking only an inch deep. And what you're receiving is only an inch deep. There is a deeper work of the Spirit, a deeper utterance, a deeper, when someone lays their hands on you under that anointing, in that atmosphere, something can go inside of you. Something down the depths of your insides get awakened and moved to the surface of your life. And that ministry you saw 15 years ago just got born. But you can't get it in these low level Divided atmospheres, non-corporate, selfish meetings. That's why usually when God does something crazy, it's with a few people. Because it's easier to get a few people in that flow and know how to hold it while God is working. Some things can happen in a moment. It takes some time to get in and to work and to get out. And we want it all done like that. And that's why some gifts and callings have never come into the higher part of their call. They can't get in a meeting where the servant of the Lord can move by the spirit with different gifts and talents and come in there and do a divine work. Part of the apostolic work of birthing and setting. And the true prophetic, to see and to describe and to bring that deposit to the surface of your life, to the true consciousness, because many of you think this is what the Lord is saying and he didn't say it. You're believing a human spirit utterance that has no power and longevity. It is a distraction of the authentic and the eternal. And God wants to rescue people, rescue them. Where are the great generals today? They're stuck in the low-level divided meetings trying to find that assistance and that authentic word that helps awaken and unwrap their gifts. The music needs to be right. The corporate body needs to be right. And God may only minister to two people in an hour or maybe just one person but he'll move 500 people to create the operating room atmosphere to help that one soul. And think of it like, and you got to be there. You've got to be a part of the atmosphere, carriers and participators and producers, so that that precious servant of the Lord, that precious handmaiden of God could receive or be healed, or have the demonic world broken off and out of their soul. For many people have demonic spirits, not in their spirit, but in their soulical and their physiological bodies. 
I don't think a Christian can be demon possessed, but an evil spirit can be in your physical body and come into parts of your, of your mind, like strongholds and so forth. And those meetings can break them. I love those meetings. I like being the one receiving. And I don't mind being the one helping. I just like being in it. Like, this is great. But you have to develop that muscle. And as a pastor, you're going to have to help the people do it. You're going to say, and the usher's going to have to help you. But we're not going to do that now. And then the way we've allowed the degree of everybody do what they want to, there's a time for everybody to minister to one another, the body ministry. I'm not knocking, but it's not all the time. Right. Not all the time. So, I'm trying to close. It's 12.02, but it's my first closing. <laughs> I'll get you on just a minute. It is, it, it, yeah. You ha yeah. If we don't have it, this revival will not be as successful right. as it's supposed to be. And we're going to have to leave us doing our own thing and come into a corporate flow and be happy wherever you fit and supply. When you do that stronger at Kingsway, greater things will happen. You have a great day. I watch you on Sundays more than you know. I watch you, even though I'm someplace else in the world. I'm in some hotel, and here's Jason going at it. Isn't that the power of the internet? I love it. You don't have to find the VHS copy and wait till you get home to watch it. You can just and get it. But you have that dynamic here. But you're going to have to allow some of the prophetic play to come to an end. To take on the maturity of a flow. Benny got his hair cut. He quit throwing his jacket around. He does it once in a while sometimes, and that's okay, but he doesn't do that as a norm. And he pulled back and made sure that what he did did not draw attention to himself, but he was able to point to the one that it's all about. Evan Roberts said, I hide behind the cross. He also said, I'm a window. Don't look at the window. Look through the window to see what you can see. We have to become that on stage. We have to get to the place where we, we, we're not the object. We're not a celebrity. If you want to be a celebrity, go to Hollywood. Right. You want to be a servant of God, disappear. Yes. And let him shine and go. Amen. I'm going to quit now. I'm not done, but I'm going to quit. And we're going to pray and we'll let you go. Amen. Father, we thank you for this great day in this class. Holy Spirit, I ask you, to take what I've shared, the scriptures, the stories, the principles, and adjust them in everybody's heart and mind in a way that it's beneficial. If I said something and a little too much or something, I ask that you adjust that supernaturally in everybody's heart and mind so it fits and it becomes a help to them. I pray for you today that the spirit life of Christianity will become a normal life to you that you'll be able to walk in the Spirit and live in the Spirit and be functional in everyday life by the Spirit. I pray that these immaturities will come to the place where you politely and respectfully lay the childness aside and take upon you the stature of a true soldier, a mature one in the kingdom to assist and to help carry the work of today and to create environments by which the other aspects of the deeper works of God can be done among us. Father, let not this generation miss one happening. Let every gift have its place. Let every soul have its release. Into your perfect will we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray that this teaching was a blessing to you, that it equipped you, that it encouraged you, and it inspired you to finish your call and to live fully obedient to everything that God has asked of you and prepared for you. Again, if you would like more information to join us this fall at Kingsway College for more classes just like this, we're training up world changers. 
through a biblical, practical, and supernatural curriculum as we discover identity, we develop our character, and are deployed into our call, I encourage you to visit kingswayal.com forward slash college or just take the leap and visit kingswayal.com forward slash apply and find out how you can be a part of this world-changing movement at Kingsway College. We'll see you this fall.